the auditorium last session yesterday at the very start. No? Only one of you. That's disturbing. You sure? No one else was? There has to be more of you, I'm sure. We had about a good two. A any, any on two? Two on three? Two on three? Because uh, it was fairly jam-packed. It was a great discussion. We had our fireside chat uh, to launch that last session. And we had uh, Guy Kelly and we had Grant Isaac. And the focus was on uranium. I found it a really interesting chat, really positive about the future of uranium, obviously taking into account what was happening in Russia, et cetera. Now, I bring that fireside chat up because both of those gentlemen know the fellow that's about to come up here on stage and join us. So can I introduce you all, please, first to Andre Lin Lindenberg. Um, Andre is Yellow Cakes CEO. And as he comes up here, I'll tell, tell you a little bit about him because uh, he's actually a man who's come from the dark side. He's come from the world of coal and he's also come from the world of diamonds. And he's transferred over to this clean, pure energy that we're looking forward to being part of the solution as we power the future of the globe. Would you please make Andre very welcome, everyone? Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for the opportunity of uh, presenting to you today. Let me just tell you a little bit about Yellow Cake. Um, it's a very, very simple story. Yellow Cake is a London listed company that acquires and stores physical uranium for the long term. So we, we buy the uranium and hold it. Uh, we don't have any exposure to mining projects, to processing risk, to geological risk, and really provide investors with a, an opportunity to invest in the uranium commodity directly with no other associated uh, mining risks. Um, we have a, a deal with Kazanamprom where we can buy up to $100 million of uranium per annum, essentially at the spot price. So that allows us to grow the company. The spot market is not very deep and not very liquid. So purchasing that amount of uranium would certainly move the price a lot. Um, we store our uranium in, in Canada and in France. In Canada, it's at the Cameco facility just outside of Toronto and in France with the Arano facility. There are only three facilities in the West where you can store physical uranium, the third being in the US. And we have a very low cost structure. We've only got two full-time employees. We've outsourced our transactional activities, our IT and our uh, um, bookkeeping and accounting. And we really target a cost base or cost leakage, if you will, of less than 1% of our net asset value. Uh, last year, because we grew significantly, significantly in the year before, our cost base was uh, about 0.6% of, of net asset value. And talking about net asset value, if I just turn to our balance sheet quickly, and you'll see that uh, we own on a performer basis about 20 million pounds of uranium. At the current spot price, that is about a billion dollars. Uh, we have an additional uh, about $18 million of cash. So our net asset value is just over a billion dollars at today's prices. And that's all we have. We don't have any debt structures. We don't have uh, multiple classes of shares and we don't have any, any hedging. Now, when we IPO'd in 2018, we took a view that uh, uranium was a commodity. Commodities are cyclical and uranium was at the bottom of the cycle. At that stage, uh, uranium was about $20, $21 uh, and underpinned Underpinning that thesis was the supply demand fundamentals. Uh, we saw a, a visible and growing demand side, and we saw a supply side that was struggling. Now, as we fast forward uh, to today, so in the intervening almost five years, uh, you know, there, there, there are four factors that have driven that demand side. So when we IPO'd, demand forecasts were about 1.5% per annum. Today, they're more like 3.5% per annum. And that is driven by the climate change and decarbonization goals that many countries are, are adopting. I think more than 70 countries have adopted these sorts of goals. Uh, and, and on the back of that, we are seeing a rapid increase in reactor build programs. We're also seeing countries supporting their existing energy fleet and nuclear fleet and the advent of small modular reactors. Since the Russian invasion of the Ukraine last year, energy security and energy independence has become a significant issue. And, and you know, this has impacted uranium and nuclear in, in a positive way. 
long-term contracting this industry runs on long-term contracts and we are starting to see long-term contracting returning to levels where it needs to be in order to replenish uh, inventories and finally you know talking about those four positive demand factors the supply side continues to struggle so when we ipo'd uh, in 2018 there were a bunch of projects that were on the table all of those projects are still on the table. Not a single project has advanced in any material way in terms of putting the asset into production. So we do see this as a supply side challenged commodity and therefore uh, uranium prices need to, need to increase. Quickly on the climate change side, uh, we've seen a number of countries adopt climate goals. Nuclear power generates the least CO2 emissions uh, compared to all other energy sources. And uh, that is now being appreciated. You know, nuclear is being appreciated for its low carbon, reliable, base load uh, energy source in terms of meeting those decarbonization goals. On the back of that, we've seen aggressive reactor build programs, uh, particularly in, in China, India, and the Middle East. If you go back 10 years, China had 18 operating reactors. Today, they have 55. They've got 21 under construction. They aim to double their reactor fleet by the end of this decade. Uh, and, you know, is that doable? I, I believe it is. China is building reactors, uh, you know, in around six years. Uh, they, they've, they've developed the expertise to build these on an industrial scale. And it's not just China. You know, we're seeing build programs in India, in the Middle East. Uh, but beyond that, um, the traditional nuclear countries of, of the US, Europe, Japan, we're seeing there an appreciation of that existing infrastructure. The Inflation Reduction Act in the US is significant. It's providing um, a lot of money to support the existing reactor fleet. In Japan, we're seeing restarts. Uh, in, in Europe, we're seeing Finland, Sweden, France, uh, the Netherlands, Belgium, all really looking at their nuclear fleet and, and making plans to support and extend the lives of, of those fleets. Just turning on to small modular reactors, um, that's a very exciting development in the nuclear space. Uh, and it's very real. We believe it is. There's something like 70 odd reactor programs being developed by countries such as China, the UK, US, Canada, by big companies such as GE, Hitachi, Rolls Royce. Um, we believe that, that this will be a reality by the end of the decade. There are a few uh, um, reactors already being constructed uh, and, and there are existing reactors on, on ships that are powering cities in the Arctic. So this is becoming a reality. And, and the Barclays Bank investment research team believe this could be a 50 trillion, well, a, a trillion dollar market by 2050. Let me just talk about energy independence and energy security briefly and, and about Russia's role in the nuclear fuel chain. Um, as you can see that uh, the nuclear fuel chain goes from the mining side where we, we produce U308, which is the product that we own and hold. It that gets converted into a gas enriched and reconverted back into fuel rods and fuel bundles. If you look at the conversion and enrichment cycle, Russia is about 35% of global capacity in conversion and 45% of capacity in enrichment. So a material player in, in the nuclear space. And the, the Russian invasion of the Ukraine last year was a game changer in, in the nuclear industry. Um, I think, you know, the Western uh, utilities suddenly realized how beholden they were to Russian fuel. Uh, in the U.S., something like 20% of the nuclear fuel that goes into the U.S. comes from Russia, and in Europe, that's about 30%. So we're seeing a huge swing by Western utilities seeking Western sources of nuclear fuel. Russia is not a very big player on the U-308 side. They only produce about 13% of, of global supply there, but much bigger on the nuclear fuel side. So with that, we are starting to see a deglobalization of the nuclear fuel industry. Uh, going forward, um, you know, it is very likely that Western nu uh, nuclear utilities, Japan and, and some other countries will seek to, uh, you know, remove themselves from, from Russia and will seek Western sources. The problem is 
that these Western sources don't exist today, and they'll take time to develop. Now, you know, uh, conversion and, and enrichment are industrial processes. Uh, they can, the technology is available, they can be developed, but it will take time and it will take money. To date, there has been no sanctions on Russian nuclear fuel. So Russian, Russian nuclear fuel is flowing into the US and into Europe without any sanctions. But that sanctions pressure is building. In the US, we've seen a bipartisan bill being presented uh, to sanction Russian uranium. And, and in Europe, the European Parliament is also looking at that. Now, those bills haven't been approved or, or seen the light of day, but it's a sense that, that you know, there's a possibility that Russian fuel could be sanctioned. And I guess evidence of, of the concern of uh, you know, governments around uh, uranium independence and security, US government um, has started procuring uranium for a strategic stockpile. They recently purchased just over a million pounds from five US producers and paid over 30% above the spot price to, to secure that material. I talked about long-term contracting. This industry runs on long-term contracts. So utilities procure about 85% of their fuel needs under long-term contracts. Historically, we've seen low rates of contracting. So reactor fuel burn is around 175 million pounds a year. And the contracting rates recently have been around 70 million pounds, uh, which has led to uh, a depletion of, of inventories held by utilities. Last year, we saw a 60% jump in contracting. Uh, the level was around 114 million pounds. I think that number it was underreported. It's probably closer to 130. And I think this year, we're going to see an, a number above that. So going forward, we, we do see a number of years where contracting has to replace, has to reach replenishment rates and probably in excess to rebuild inventories. And putting all of that together, you know, going back to my earlier point about this being a supply challenge industry, if you look at supply and demand and, and just focusing on that yellow box in the middle, the estimates are that by the end of this decade, we're short of 33 million pounds of uranium per annum. Now, bear in mind that Kazakhstan which is the world's largest producer of uranium, 42% of global production, produces 55 million pounds. So you almost need another Kazakhstan by the end of the decade. And that assumes that these probable projects that represent almost 26 million pounds all come on stream. And we know in the mining industry that, you know, bringing projects on time and on budget, you know, the, the industry doesn't have a great, great track record in, in, in that uh, regard. So I guess just, just pulling all of that together, we believe yellow cake is very well positioned. We only hold physical uranium. We don't have any operating risks. We've got a very small team and a very low cost structure. And we're seeing, you know, the, the mood swing towards nuclear in terms of de decarbonization, energy transition, now more recently, energy security, energy independence, and the appreciation of nuclear's role in, in those two uh, regards. So, you know, Yellow Cake owns 20 million pounds of uranium. We will look to grow that uh, over, over time. We issue shares at a premium to equity, a premium to net asset value, and don't issue shares when we're at a discount. So we're very excited about these, you know, confluence of events which are driving uh, the nuclear space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Really interesting chat. Technology Metals is next up on stage. They're developing their Murchising Technology Metals project in the Midwest of Western Australia, and that is a long life, high grade vanadium project. We're back to vanadium, uh, producing a high purity product for both the steel and battery markets. Do you know that the original Model T Fords are still turtling around because they've got in them? Vanadium. vanadium it's very hardy that's right so back to this vanadium in 2023 uh, technology metals australia has recently developed its maiden batch of vanadium electrolyte which is suitable for use in vanadium red box i said that right redox flow redox. batteries excuse me an important long duration energy solution that's going to help the world on the net zero journey would you please make welcome this fellow managing director in apprentice welcome in 
Thank you, Chrissy, and thanks everyone for joining us uh, this morning. Thanks to the team at uh, Resource Connect Asia for uh, inviting us along. So Stewie and Prue and, and uh, Jackson, thanks very much. And of course, the lead sponsors, Tribeca and Argonaut. So we are going to be talking about vanadium and we're going to be talking about vanadium for a cleaner future and developing a vanadium project in the, the middle of Western Australia. When the button works. There we go. So this is available on our website. So I'll let you read that at your leisure. So vanadium is supporting our move to net zero. So vanadium, as, as my, uh, one of the speakers in the previous session, Vincent Elgar talked about primary use at the moment is in steel. And it has a really big role to play in reducing carbon emissions related to, to steel applications. But where the real future is, where the real opportunities are, in, is in large-scale stationary storage batteries. So the vanadium redox flow batteries, and uh, that's really, as, as Christy was saying, a, a market that we're very focused on. So, as I said, located in the middle of uh, Western Australia, so a great, great spot to be. Um, just, I guess, some real key points. You know, it is all about the geology. And one of the earlier speakers yesterday talked about, you know, we've got the rocks. So it is about the geology, having the right geology, the right metallurgy to enable a, uh, a very, uh, I guess, reasonably straightforward process and at the right cost point. Um, we are looking at doing conventional integrated processing on site. So we take it from those rocks all the way through to our final vanadium pentoxide product. So our high purity product that then will be able to go into that battery market. Um, and I guess one of the real key things we achieved earlier this year is we've now got some financial support from the Danish Export Credit Agency. So EKF are uh, supporting us to the value of around 150 million Aussie dollars for the development of the project. Corporate overview, we listed in uh, December 2016. So we've been, been around for a little while. We had $12 million cash at the bank at the end of December last year, um, but still only 210 million shares on issue. So quite a nice um, tight structure. Um, the other key takeaway from this slide is um, our major shareholder, Resource Capital Funds. So Resource Capital Funds came on in a capital raise we did in September 21. Uh, raised $20 million, which was our last uh, last capital raise. Um, they're sitting on our register with a touch over 17% of, of, uh, of the shares in the company. So fantastic supporter. They did a lot of work to understand the vanadium market, did a lot of work to understand which where the entry point was, and, and they chose us back in uh, September 21 for the, that investment. Um, Experience board and management, that's I guess the standard quote, but I guess one of the real key things for us is um, our operations or our, our, our project readiness team. So again, Eddie Rigg talked about it this morning, is it rocks or people? And I tend to agree with him, different stages of projects, it is rocks or people or both. Um, we're in that study and implementation phase. So we've got a guy called David English on our team, so our chief operating officer. David was actually the guy who built one of the mines that Eddie was talking about, De Grusser for Samfire. So very, very experienced project developer in the West Australian market. And also really key for us, he spent two years at the only previous operating vanadium project in Western Australia at Windermara. So he's got both the, the project development as well as the operating background. So really strong part of our team and he's building a really, really good execution team around him. Sustainability and our ESG, um, very, very important for everything we do, as has been from the very beginning. Um, clearly, the focus is from an investment point of view has moved more and more into this space. And again, I guess, you know, getting a Danish export credit agency support really does show that we've moved a long way in developing up our ESG. We're working with WSP Golder on really being in a position ready to go on, on that construction and, and really supporting that ESG profile. So. Um, really good engagement with our local community, our local Indigenous community, and, and a very strong focus on, on our governance. One of the other things we've really focused on in the last uh, little while is building a, a really strong, um, I guess, partnerships around us. And again, one of the things that Eddie commented on when you're in this phase, in this pre-development into moving into development phase, Really, really important to have those strong partnerships. So we, we've got an MOU with Tata Steel that we entered into last August, is last October, which is really focused around the steel market. Um, we've also got a, a really strong relationship with a Japanese vanadium electrolyte producer, LE System. So really good uh, access into those markets. And we, on Monday of this week, we announced a, a MOU with a, an Indian vanadium redox flow battery company, Delectric, which I'll touch on a bit further, but really strong partnerships that we're developing with end users in our market. So really Really, really important and on the other side of that slide we talk about EKF which I've mentioned with, with that funding support that's linked to FL Schmidt. FL Schmidt are a Danish equipment mining equipment provider they are the leaders in vanadium processing technology so we've been working with them since 2018 so really important relationship there and that as I say links back to then EKF supporting the uh, funding development of the project. 
So a tier one project in a tier one location, um, I won't go into too much detail around that, but a couple of the key points for us, um, shallow weathering, which is really, really important when it comes to our processing, and I'll touch on that in the next slide, conventional integrated processing. So this is the processing that is actually happening as, as we speak in other parts of the world. So we're, we're gonna be adopting what's already tried and true and known in the, in the uh, world of vanadium. Um, and high purity vanadium product, as I mentioned, so that'll be 99.5% ideal for the battery market. But also for the first nine years, we'll be producing an ilmenite byproduct, so a titanium dioxide byproduct, which really from a, a funding point of view helps to de-risk the project, having that dual revenue stream through the process. And the bottom bullet point there, the numbers we've been working on, you know, we're, we're close to about 200 million Australian um, in EBITDA every year for 25 years. So very, very strong financial metrics around our project. This is really important, and I guess it sets us apart from a lot of our peers in the in the developing vanadium space. This um, ability to have fresh ore close to surface. Fresh ore is really, really important in the processing. It means that we don't have to do a really fine grind in our material. We get a really high recovery, so we don't have to be overly capital intensive at the front end. Um, our, our actual yield into a product is is really important and really high compared to a lot of our peers in the industry. So really sets us up well and again goes back to that point of being able to then just use conventional processing which uh, is is out there and operating so long section through our main gabinet into the deposit the red line is the, is the base of oxidation so we can see particularly on the north end there it's a very very thin veneer before we get into the really high yielding material the uh, section on the right hand side is our Yarrabubba deposit so it's a cross section through that Showing, showing that variable, you know, I guess the oxidation profile, but in, the, in the, the pink unit there, that's our high grade unit. That's the economic driver of the deposit. Very, very shallow oxidation in that area as well. So really important to differentiate us. Touch on this quickly, I guess the, again, you know, we've, we've heard this through a number of speakers over the course of the last two days about the geopolitical situation we're in. Fanatium is a really interesting one in that 61% that, uh, of, of supply has, historically come from China, and then 16% come from Russia. So you put that together and you see a huge amount of, of supply that's coming out of those two jurisdictions, which clearly when we're looking at uh, security supply chain, um, end users are looking for diversity. So we sit there in uh, in Australia, Australia hosts around 18% of economic resources of vanadium in the world and currently have no production. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to fix that. We'll be the first uh, new large scale vanadium project to come online. Um, the obligatory cost curve. So this is numbers from the, from uh, last year. Um, the blue star there. Hopefully you can all see that. That's that's where we expect to be. So so we're right down the bottom end of the cost curve. So um, ideally placed again a long long life asset, twenty five year life as as it stands today. You want to have that low cost profile so you can go through all the cycles over that period of time. The other key takeaway from there is that on the right hand side, some of those higher cost producers are actually at, at costs above what the current uh, vanadium price is. So you can see that from, from that to en enable increased production, we're going to have to be looking at a higher price and that incentive pricing comes into the equation. So primary uses of vanadium, I touched on it earlier, primary use currently is into steel, into construction steel, majority of. There's also a, a, a really strong use into high purity vanadium going into specialty alloys for the aeronautical industry. And right now that's a big driver of the market because the, uh, I guess the rebound in the aer aeronautical industry has happened much quicker than what everyone expected coming out of COVID. So at the moment that's putting a bit of pressure on the vanadium price. But the couple of pie charts there are really illustrative of why we're targeting the battery market. So this comes from CRU who've done some work for us supporting our studies that we're in the middle of, saying basically from 2021, when 90% of vanadium went into steel, by 2040, they're expecting 75% of vanadium to go into batteries. So massive growth in the overall market, but also massive growth in that application. We're looking at by the beginning of next decade, around 45,000 tonnes per annum shortfall in supply. And putting that into context, we're about a 12,500 tonne per annum producer. So there's a big opportunity for, for a number of us to get up and running by the end of this decade and really feed into that, uh, into that uh, demand equation. Bit of context around what's happening in the battery space. So one of the big things that's really emerging and we've, we, in the industry we've understood for a while is that China's really driving some really large scale batteries. So long duration storage, 
really big batteries, but the numbers only really came to, to light in the last month or so of what they're actually putting into the you know, volumes that are going into these. So, so we see in 2022, there's something like um, you know, six or 7% of, of supply of global supply went into batteries in, uh, in China in that year. And they're forecasting that to increase to 15,000 tonnes in the current year, which is getting up there, you know, sort of eight or 9% of total, total supply. And again, will be producing 12 and a half thousand tons per annum so putting that into context it's uh um we are, we're a significant producer but in the context of that uh that demand side um we're, we're quite modest um the u.s inflation reduction act and a lot of people have been talking about this again driving a big demand into this space and a lot of the offshore battery developers are moving into into the u.s including um summertime electric to really support that growth and there's going to be a big number of applications into that space. Um, Chris, you raised this right at the beginning. We're looking at, at, at the downstream. We're looking at adding value to our vanadium in Australia and then beyond. And we're working with Ali System, which is a well-established Japanese vanadium electrolyte producer. They've got an operating facility up in Fukushima, which we visited last year. We've been working with them for the last couple of years. And earlier this year, they took our product all the way from raw ore through to, to high purity vanadium electrolyte. So really ticking the boxes and, and confirming with end users that we are in the right space as far as producing that electrolyte. So we're working with them to develop our downstream in Australia and beyond. And then, as I mentioned, you know, we've got a key partnership announced at the beginning of this year with a group called Delectric. So Delectric's an Indian group that is, is developing these vanadium redox flow batteries that are, again, on an exponential growth curve. So I think a couple of years ago, they were talking about single digit batteries going being deployed. This year, they've already got 100 um, BRFBs on their order books. So massive growth. They're recognising that they need to be partnering up with primary producers like ourselves to make sure they've got product to feed into their um, growing demand. They're also active in, in Europe, Saudi Arabia, North America. They've got an established an office in, in WA. So they're really pushing out into the international market. They're actually putting a battery into Europe, which will be around supporting a EV recharging station. So um, uh, solar generated power going into one of these batteries and then driving through to EVs. So, where are we at? So we actually completed a feasibility study on the project back in 2019. We've done some work on refreshing that and came up with a, a new reserve in August of last year. We're now in, the, in what we're calling the implementation phase of the project. So moving through, we've engaged with our key partners from a project level to work alongside David. Um, we're working with our traditional owners to make sure that they're really included in what we're doing for this long-term project. Um, and that ties into the, the permitting. And again, a big common theme over the last couple of days is progressing those permitting um, sides of things. And that's a big key focus for us. Um, and it is all about being in a position so we can really move, move this um, uh, implementation phase through. So I think, you know, we believe very strongly we're a compelling investment. We believe very strongly we're going to be the next primary vanadium mine coming online. And, uh, you know, we'd like to see some you know, significant progress being made in that space over the next six months or so. Um, we've got a reserve upgrade coming in the next little while, and that'll flow through to an updating of our, of our financial model, which will put us in a bankable position to supporting the funding requirements. But, you know, we are... Uh, in industry industry leading tier one project quality management and, and, and team around that to bring that through to fruition um, we are a critical mineral supported around the globe um, Australia US Europe as uh, identified as a critical mineral in the space we've got a great team to deliver on that and you know with partners like RCF and partners like EKF we are actually really well placed to bring the project through so thank you very much Well done, Mr. Brendis. Well done. All right. Uh, if you are interested in um, pegmatites, lithium, calcium, tantalum pegmatites in particular, Dave, uh, Colin Locke is in our other auditorium right now, um, Krakatoa Resources. There's been a lot of news on them and a lot of news coverage on them in the last couple of days. So you might want to go in and check out what that's about in relation to their King Tamba project, which is over in Western Australia. In here, we're going to talk Aura Energy and joining us on stage is MD. Dave Woodnall. Good day, Dave. Uh, Chrissy, thank you. Hi, and you're going to talk to us about uranium today because they have got uh, an Australian-based significant near-term low-cost producer. That's a bit of a tongue twister and a half for me at this time in the morning. Uh, that has major long-life polymetallic and uranium projects. 
with large resources in one of my countries close to the heart of chocolate over in Sweden. In Sweden. Would you please make Dave very welcome today as he tells us the story of Aura Energy. Thank you. Today I'll talk about Aura Energy strategy, what we're doing and differentiate what Aura is and its, and its assets to many of the near-term producers. So what's the highlights? We've got a, we get, we're targeting to become a significant near-term producer. We've got nearly 60 million pounds of U308 in the ground. We've got our permits in place and we're starting to progress to get into production by the first quarter of 2025. We've just finished a, a enhanced feasibility study. That feasibility study has shown the robust economics that we believe this project will deliver. We've got low capital and operating costs, and that is significant as I'll talk in more detail, that that drives this project. We are, it's an open pit, shallow digging, no crushing, no grinding, and it delivers a, a excellent um, margin with all in sustainable costs lower than $30 a pound. As many speakers have been talking about, this has been driven by the global uh, market to decarbonise, of which nuclear will play a significant um, part in it. The EFS has been focused predominantly on what we call the Tourist West, and some 250 kilometres to the west, we've got the Tourist West area, which has slightly higher grade, uh, and we will start focusing on bringing that into our uh, project and operation as we move forward. Our Hagorn project uh, in Sweden, and I'll talk about some of the noise that's occurred in the last couple of days. This is a large, you know, multi-decade operation. It contains your key battery metals in vanadium and nickel. It also has zinc in it, has uranium in it, and has a byproduct of sulfate of potash. So in the heart of Europe, in the heart of Sweden, there's a, there's a mine that'll be around for, for close to a century. We've progressed off takes. We have an off take that we signed in 2019. We are continuing to progress our off take and we're starting to look at the financing component, which is targeting an FID decision later on this year. Corporately, 558 million shares on issue. Um, we've got uh, 6.3 million in the bank. So we, we, we spend about half a million a month. So they've got plenty in there to do what we need to do. And we're looking to grow in the two areas of Sweden and Mauritania. The strategy is based in a series of short, medium and longer term objectives. In the short term between now and 2026, we're looking to build the tourist project, get it up and running at 800,000 pounds of uranium per year. Then look at additional resources that we're pretty confident exist in this area and then advance to the construction and expansion to over 2 million pounds of uranium at Tiris. We'll progress Hagon uh, to get through an exploitation permit and then into the permitting phase and we will assess other opportunities as they come, on, come through. By 27 to 30, we'll be producing consistently 2 million pounds of uh, uranium. We should have a Hagorn uh, approvals in place. And then we should be looking at, similar to many of the vanadium uh, producers, looking to go downstream in a strategic alliance with, with other parties. Beyond 2030, we see ourselves expanding in Mauritania and developing the, and getting the Hagorn project into operation. So, for a small company like Aura, we've got a great pipeline of growth that we believe we can deliver on. I won't talk much about the global market, but just to point out a, um, a, a point. So far this, this last couple of days, I've heard anything from 162 million to 170 and talking to a few people in North America in the last couple of days, they're predicting that the actual um, 
demand for uranium in the last year is about 235 million. So let's assume it's about 162 million as it, as it stated. Yeah, we, we've talked just recently about what's being planned. Some in construction proposed and planned is some 507 uh, nuclear reactors. If we put the skeptics aside and say, well, what is China looking to do as a part of its process to get energy security in that country? Half of those are in China. So all I can say is that the demand that's being that's going to drive this industry is somewhere between 80 and 162 million pounds that needs to be developed and produced. That's the growth that we see in this area. So let's look at Mauritania. Our tourist project, some 1,450 kilometres to the northeast of Nouakchott, the capital of Mauritania, has significant leverage to the uranium price. It's a low capital cost. It'll cost just under 90 million US to get into production. It'll produce 800,000 pounds a year, and then we'll expand that by a further 90 million to have a 150% increase in production to 2 million pounds a year. It's shallow, free dig. There's no crushing and grinding, so we've got excellent margins. At the moment, with about 50% of our resource mined, we've got a 16-year mine life. In near term, we've got off-takes in place. We're progressing those off-takes. We're starting to engage in, into the financing of the project. Our front-end engineering design has commenced and is due to be complete in Q3, Q4 this year. We're fully permitted. Our ESIA has been approved. And in the last month or so, we announced that we were able to successfully get issued the two key mining conventions, which give us fiscal stability over the next 30 years in Mauritania. So we're well placed. Mauritania, not many people know where Mauritania is. When I talk Mauritania, they talk about Mauritius and a number of other M countries that exist. But it's got a well-established uh, mining law. You've got people like BP and Cosmos Energy that are developing a massive uh, offshore gas field that's coming into production this year. There are several other offshore gas uh, fields that are looking to be developed. BP just recently announced they will go to the second uh, offshore gas field and develop that. It's about two and a half billion dollars US to develop. There are good roads and infrastructure. There's, there's companies like Kinross Gold there. You've got First Quantum. So it's not an unknown to, to, to this resource area. And Mauritania is going to play a significant part in the global energy solution. It's well situated close to Europe, not too far away from the, from the North American, and it has a, an ability to grow a successful country. We have a strong partnership with the uh, Mauritania mining company, Anapalm, um, who own 15% of the project. And we're working collaborative with Anapalm to progress this project forward as quickly as we can. So let's just talk briefly about some of the mining. It's shallow mining, so the average uh, pit depth is four meters. So we'll get an excavator that can dig about seven meters, which is the deepest part of this particular these deposits. There's no drilling and blasting, which is some 15 to 20 percent of mining costs and 85 to 90% of the material gets placed directly back into the mined out areas. So the environmental footprint is significantly uh, reduced. Those benefits of, of shallow mining, no drilling blasting have an impact on the cost within, within the mining area. And we've got a strip ratio, including internal uh, waste of less than 0.8 to one. In the processing, the run of mine ore gets delivered to, a, to the, the plant, a beneficiation plant. We put it through a feeder breaker. We then put it through a rotary scrubber. We add water and then we filter anything from minus 75 to minus 150 micron. 90% of the uranium goes direct into our leaching plant, which is pumped some six kilometres down a pipe system. So no crushing, no grinding. That has significant benefits in terms of capital costs to develop the mine. And the other component is because only 50, between 10 to 15% of the material 
from the mine actually goes into the leaching, the leaching component is a lot smaller. That's the difference between what Tiris is and most near-term uranium producers. It has capital and also operating cost benefits. In our operating costs, we see life of mine C1 costs at about $25 a pound and uh, all in sustaining costs of, of under $30 a pound. So a great opportunity to, to develop strong cash flows. Our capital expenditure, as I've spoken, is, is, is 87.9 million on the initial phase. And then once we get that settled down and into production, then we'll go into an expansion and spend another 90 million to get it into production. When you talk to finances, they talk to you about two key issues. The first is your project delivery risk. Well, at 80, 90 million dollars, we can mitigate that risk importantly. The other risk they talk about is your operational readiness and getting into production. And the ability to have a smaller uh, project at the start to get the, 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 the operators trained, the knowledge transfer to get the right technical people into this area gives us confidence that the model we're putting together is going to allow this project to be very successful. And you note that the fee grade into our, um, into our leaching plant is over 2,000 parts per million. I'll just briefly talk about, that's the startup, 1.25 million beneficiation plant from run of mine, then you've got 230,000 tonnes of that material goes into your leaching. In the back end, we've got a, a 3.5 million pounds of capacity, and that's really looking at what's the benefit of building a smaller one versus a, what would be a, an average uh, size plant. That gives, then gives us, as we ramp up, we can put additional beneficiation plants and leaching. In the feed study at the moment, we're in the process of further optimising this to find out where the real constraints and, and bottlenecks are in the system and allow those to get further added value. On the exploration side, this is the Tiris East area. Tiris West is some 250 kilometres out to the west. And you can see the blue shade, the blue round, the blue areas highlighted. That's where the resources are. The black are areas that are radiometric surveys that historically we've found about 1.3 million pounds per square kilometre. Also, I'd note that to the right of this red line here, there's been no radiometric surveys done. So we're pretty confident on near-term uh, exploration success as we move this uh, project forward. In Tourist West, the average grade of Tourist East is about 235 parts per million. In Tourist West, it's somewhere about 300 to 400 parts per million. So in the, as you build this project and move it forward, we believe exploration has got uh, great opportunities in this area. And then what we do is put an in intermediary product, bring it back to our central plant and produce a U3I. Uh, what are we doing? I'm not gonna go through all of this, but basically feed studies on, on track, that's on track to be completed in, uh, in the third, fourth quarter this year. We're looking to do a financial decision in Q1 where we've identified the long lead items. We'd look to be placing orders for those to ensure that we get the project delivery on time. And then we'll progress to starting uh, commissioning in late 24 and then into commercial production in early 25. Just briefly on the Hagorn, this is a massive, about two and a half billion tonnes of resource, vanadium, nickel, uh, zinc, molybdenum and uranium. And as I said earlier, in, in, the, in the chemistry that we, we do, we actually recover a sulfate of potash. We've got a scoping study that we'll release uh, in the next couple of months, which will show what we, what we think the value is. Um, and also with some work uh, that's happening within Sweden, we're pretty confident that we should be able to uh, extract the uranium uh, with community and government support. And it'd be remiss of me to not finish off to explain that whilst that it was reported that the Swedish government had rejected um, the ban, not moving on the ban of uranium, it's actually incorrect. 
uh, private members' bills were rejected, which is typical of most de democratic uh, countries where the government wants to control the agenda. As I say, significant near-term uranium producer. It's got low capital, low operating costs with easy and, and uh, great potential for scale. And it's been driven by the global decarbonisation that's occurring around the world. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. We're moving over to lithium now and Lake Resources is taking to the stage. They're a clean lithium developer utilising proven iron exchange extraction technology for production of sustainable, high purity lithium from its flagship Kachi, pro Kachi project uh, within the lithium triangle, which of course is in Argentina. So they have appeared up on the screen once already at this conference on Mr. Joe Lowry's famous lithium triangle dot picture that he put up yesterday. Let's hear the details. Would you please make Peter Nilsson, their CFO, very welcome everyone. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It gives me great pleasure to present to you today on behalf of Lake Resources. A bit of housekeeping first. I'd like to uh, point you to the disclaimer and encourage you to read this at your leisure as I will be making some forward-looking statements. Lake's view on demand for high-purity lithium is that the supply and demand will not be in steady state until we reach 2040. As you can see on the diagram uh, on the left-hand side there, that the compound annual growth rate won't start to settle down and even out at around 9% until 2040. On the supply side, DLE and direct lithium production technologies are expected to accelerate the scalability of supply. Timing of projects coming online is unpredictable and more and more projects are moving to the right on the timeline for various reasons. High demand for non-Chinese supply, driven by the fact that companies and countries are looking, for, looking to establish uh, independence. And also the lack of lithium battery alternatives at this particular point in time. The Lake story. Lake is a six year startup we have offices in Houston and in Argentina, and we're listed on the Australian Stock Exchange. The Kachi project, which is our flagship project, started out in a pre-feasibility study to produce 25,000 tonnes per annum. However, this time last year, due to demand, resource size, and attractive economics, we decided to, to produce a definitive feasibility study based on 50,000 tonnes per annum. Kachi has a large resource, which is yet to be completely defined. We updated our JORC statement in January this year, where we doubled the measured and indicated resource. Our path to production is defined, and we are at this point in time working towards completing our definitive feasibility study. Current management team is reviewing the execution plan to ensure that we have a successful project. DLE, but more specifically, iron exchange uses significantly less water, not only because we re-inject the brine back into the reservoir, but also the amount of water that is needed to complete the process. As with any project, we need world-class partners. And I'll talk about our world-class partners in a slide, a few, a few slides time. We've also increased our management team significantly over the past six months, and we've increased our strength in areas such as construction, processing, drilling, people, and industrial relations, all play an important part in moving the Kachi project into production. Not only have we looked at the management team, but we've also looked at the board, and we brought on three new directors to help us transition from exploration and evaluation to development and then through to production. And a part of bringing these three new directors on board, we've also increased our governance and oversight. As you can see uh, on the diagram on the right-hand side, we operate in the lithium triangle where you've got Bolivia to the north, 
Chile to the, to the left and Argentina. This, this blue dot here is where we have three projects, our Calchari, Olaroz and Paso. They are in um, early stages of evaluation and they are up in the Huhui province. However, the main focus is on the Karchi project, which is the, the bottom dot here, and moving that from exploration and valuation and into development. We have recently released their new jork statement, doubling our measured and indicated from 1 million to 2.2 million tonnes of lithium carbonate equivalent. Further drilling is required to fully define the resource as the resource is open in all directions and at depth. Our technology partner, Lilac, has successfully been operating a demonstration plant on site since October last year. We have, the demonstration plant has run for well over 2000 hours now, and also is very near producing the 120,000 liters that is required under um, the conditions to operate the plant. The results of the first batch of the lithium chloride, uh, which was processed at Saltworks in Canada, uh, we released the announced the results of that uh, process on Monday, and it was very uh, significant milestone for lake resources with the purity coming back at 99.8%. We're currently working on capital costs and timing to first lithium, which will be full part of an operational update that will come out at the end of Q2. On the screen here now is a flow diagram of what the process will, will look like when uh, completed on site. With the iron exchange technology, the process from brine to lithium becomes faster, scalable, high recoveries and sustainable. Faster, so when the brine first comes into the iron exchange modules, three hours to when we produce lithium chloride. Scalable, so the, the very design of the iron exchange is modular so that we don't have to build one big iron, iron exchange module to produce 50,000 tonnes, we will choose multiple uh, modules. Recoveries, we're finding that we're receiving recoveries of around 80%, which also helps us maximise the value of the resource in which we're operating. And sustainable, low water usage in the production process, and then the reinjection of the brine back into the reservoir. The diagram on site there, the photo probably doesn't do justice to the uh, the size of the cellar in which we're operating. And the dirt road that you can see there, that uh, goes off to the right, which is where we currently have our office and, uh, and camp. Much of the land required for the production and the process plant will be in a footprint of 500 metres by 800 metres. This is replacing the about 30 square kilometres of evaporation ponds. Brine reinjection back into the resource to ensure no change to the water table, which is significant for the fresh water that sits on top of the brine, but also the people who draw from that fresh water table in the two towns that uh, are located near where we're operating. Local communities are already benefiting from employment and training, but not only training for our employees, but also the local people in the communities on how to run a small business. We talked before about world-class partners. We've briefly touched on Lilac. Lilac have the ability to earn up to 25% stake in the Karchi project, which they are well on track to do at this particular point in time. Funding, we have expressions of interest from the United Kingdom Export Credit Agency, their counterpart in Canada, EDC, as well as Citibank and JP Morgan to fund up to 70% of this project. With the significant ESG benefits, it also lowers the cost of that funding. The loan term will be eight and a half years post-construction. We have two offtake partners who will take 25,000 tonnes per annum each uh, in this project. And not only will they take 25,000 tonnes each to fully commit the offtake uh, for this project, but they're also going to take 
a strategic investment of 10% each in lake resources. We have four milestones that we would like to achieve in 2023. We have already achieved one of those milestones with the report on the purity of our product from the lilac process on exchange from the salt works conversion. In late May, we'll come out with the operational update and that operational update will come out with capital costs to build this plant and also time to first production. We are working, the management team focus at the moment is on completing the definitive feasibility study and that will be out June, July this year. Not long after we have the completion of the DFS, we will also have the completion of our environmental impact assessment and the lodgement of that document with the Katamarkin government. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. You were very, very quick off the mark there. Did you want to take a question from anyone since you've got a minute up your sleeve? No. Would you like me to come back and have a beer with you later today and talk more in depth then? All right. Okay, let's do that. Would you put your hands together again, please? Hold well on, team. Now, as you can see, the chairs are moving back on stage behind me, so we will dim the lights again and we're going to go into fireside chat mode. So I would like to call up to the stage, please, our presenters. Oh, this one we are running a little bit early so if they're up the back i will understand completely but we've got tim campbell who is the vp uh, esg and corporate secretary for global atomic uh, monica Kras has joined us she's the vp corporate development for next gen energy and leading the conversation today we have the inimitable mr guy keller uh, portfolio manager from tribeca nuclear energy opportunities uh, joining us up on the stage And possibly not. This is where you're going to find that I do not have the necessary knowledge in these particular subjects with which to cover. So we'll just say, if you'd like to have one of those little pomodoros that we were talking about yesterday for a minute, rearrange things on your page and uh, just have a little bit of a break. And I will go outside and just chase them up because we are running five minutes early. And the nice thing is you now get to just spend a bit of time by yourself, recalibrate, and then your brain will be all ready to take on the next bit of information. So just give me two minutes and I will go and grab them for us. You can even talk. How's that? I'll let you talk in the auditorium. There we go. Right, I found them everyone, so just recompose ourselves, leading the charge, we can see the inimitable Guy Keller taking to the stage first, there should be a microphone on everyone's seat team, we've got half an hour up our sleeve, Guy I'll give you a five minute bell towards the end, joining us in the middle we have Monica and uh, coming up at the rear there is Tim, Guy you're in charge of guarding, as I said 30 minutes, I'll ring the bell at 25 minutes. You have some notes carefully crafted. That would be handy. What are we going to talk about for 30 minutes? <laughs> I'll give Good. you a title and you see how you go with it, okay? So the title for your fireside chat, as we imagine the fire burning behind you, is Delivering Fuel for a Clean Energy Future. That's your cue. The next 30 minutes is up to the three of you. That's exactly what's happening. Uh, and thank you, everybody. Um, and still good morning or good midday. So yes, we're back here again today uh, uh, to focus on the, the nuclear sector and the future facing commodity that uh, provides that uh, raw material to, uh, to give us all carbon free baseload electricity uh, for years and years and years to come. So I'm, uh, I'm privileged to be able to, to sit up here with uh, uh, two of our um, companies, two Canadians who've graciously made their way over here to uh, to Asia for us, uh, Monica from NextGen and Tim from Global Atomic. Um, 
what we might probably do, I think, is just start with a little bit of, a, of an introduction from both of you as to, um, you know, your company, where your project is, what stage we're at with that project, because we're not in the echo chamber of, of a uranium or nuclear conference that they're all, we're all used to attending where everybody knows the stories quite intimately. So, so Monica, we might just start with you and you can uh, give us a brief introduction on the, on the company. Hi, I'm Monica Cross. I'm from NextGen Energy. We are a uranium asset in Saskatchewan. We're the lowest cost, biggest uranium development company in the world. We have 256 million pounds of uranium at 3%. So that's 30 times the average grade. So we're, we'll be in production in 2027 and we'll be producing about 30 million tons, 30 million pounds a year. Okay, so to put that into, into perspective, we're, we're roughly around 180 to 200 million pound per year uh, consumption. At the moment, we're producing, the producers are doing around 125 million pounds. By 2027, we will see uh, that demand going up through 200 million pounds. And so when the Arrow deposit starts producing, uh, we talked yesterday, I don't know if anyone was, who, who was here yesterday, but there's, there's 50 odd reactors being built at the moment. Um, and the requirements of those reactors that are coming online the next five years will basically equate to the output of the Arrow uh, deposit. So a very significant required asset that needs to come to market. <laughs> and uh, But it still doesn't actually solve the primary mine supply deficit problem we have to fuel the existing fleet. Um, so we'll move on to, uh, to Tim Campbell from Global Atomic. Tim, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, thanks, Guy. Um... Tim Campbell from Global Atomic. We're located in Niger, West Africa, and we have a, a high-grade gold, uh, high gold, gold, excuse me, uh, uranium project there, high-grade for um, African standards, not quite like uh, Monica's, but um, we're working towards production in January uh, Q1, let's say, of 2025. Um, yeah, we'll be running at about four and a half million pounds a year. And so uh, speaking to Guy's point, they're looking to fill the uh, supply deficit that's fast approaching. And we all know that uranium obviously is, it's a raw material that's producing carbon-free electricity. However, for, for mining methods, there's still a focus on, uh, on the environmental standards. Uh, Monica, perhaps you could just talk about the uniqueness of, of, of how uh, you guys plan to to, to mine the deposit uh, and and just with minimal surface area disturbance and and uh, and and how that's sort of unique and how you, your approach. Yeah, so we're blessed with um, a basement hosted uranium deposit. So this is pretty unique in the context of the uranium market in general. So there have been two other mines, the, the Ranger Mine and Eagle Point, that were also basement hosted. Uh, because due to this, we're able to have a very low surface area footprint. So we're only mining 1,300 tons per day. So to give you an example, it's two small rooms. I would take up maybe 10% of this entire room, but that's all we're mining per day. Um, be because we're basement hosted, uh, we have a basement hosted deposit, we're also able to put our tailings underground. This is again, unique into, in the industry. There's not many mines out there. I think there's one other mine out there that's doing an underground tailings deposit. So we have minimal footprint, and then we also have very minimal environmental risk with all of our tailings underground. And, and Tim, I guess the same question to you. Um, you know, you are probably the highest grade deposit in, in Africa. Um, you know, mining off a uh, an underground approach off a, off a decline. Do you want to talk also to the point of, of how important that is for, for, for your tonnage movement and, and, and disturbance? Yeah, absolutely. We are uh, also looking to mine at the rate of about a thousand tons per day, and it's an underground mine. Uh, what, what we'll be doing is putting half of the half of the tailings will be going underground. So what, half of what we bring up from underground will go back underground, and the balance will be used for uh, construction on site. So again, it's uh, a relatively low impact operation, uh, benefiting from high grade there and uh, allowing us to, uh, you know, minimize the impacts for uh, on the ground and, and for the area surrounding us. 
Okay, that's great. Um, I guess when we're, we're, we're you know, there's, we're not just trying to appease shareholders and, and investors with respect to, to being respectful of the environmental footprint. It's obviously the community as well. Uh, Monica, NextGen has made some uh, phenomenal moves forward in, in community engagement in, uh, in um, uh, the Athabasca Basin with the communities there in First Nation. Can you just talk to the progress you've made and, and, and why that's so important and, uh, and, and what needs to be done going forward? So we've been engaging with the communities before we even started drilling. So before in, in 2013, we were engaging with the communities. And part of that reason, they own the land. They're there before us. They're the indigenous communities. And we want to make sure that they're benefiting from the land that they actually own. So we were putting in programs like a breakfast program and uh, providing breakfast for 1,000 school children per day. And then we're also providing training programs so they can have lifelong skills. And that it could benefit potentially our mind, but also lifelong skills that they can bring forward to other areas uh, wherever they choose to live. It, it, the way that we've gone about our community relations has really helped us with our environmental assessment. And even so much so that the Indigenous communities are vouching for this project. They're going to Parliament and speaking on our behalf, saying we want this project permitted today. So it's gone a very long way, and we've done such tremendous things that the government is applauding what we're doing in the area. And are you finding that that you're setting the standard for, for others who have maybe not taken that as seriously in the region? Yes, definitely. I think we are setting a new standard, be, being like, you know, talking to the community before you even start drilling. I think that should be, you know, the new standard of mining. Mining has come a long way in general. There's, I think mining's leading the charge on ESG compared to other uh, industries out there. But I mean, in terms of setting a standard, we, we know, we think, you know, doing best practices for community engagement, and environmental engagement should be, you know, a priority. And, and Tim, obviously Africa, uh, you know, a mining project can, can, can make or break communities. Um, with respect to job opportunities and what have you. Um, you know, you're in a, in a country where uh, the French have been mining there for a number of years. They've, they've lost, they've just recently shut down a mine. How important is, is what you're doing viewed by the community and the opportunities that's giving them? Yeah, it's, uh, it, it's viewed very, uh, as very important by, by the communities and uh, also the regional and national governments. Uh, guys referencing Arano, the French nuclear company, which has been mining in Niger for 50 years, and just 100 kilometers north of us, they had two mines going, uh, one of which just got just got mined out and closed after uh, after 50 years, uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, what, what that's done is that's left a hole in the budget of, of the national government. N Niger is quite a ranks at, at the low end of the UN Development Index and uh, needs the money and, uh, and, and feels, feels the absence of that revenue stream, which would be royalties and, and tax uh, and other fees. Um, but so too to the, uh, the city uh, north of us there, they, they're feeling it too because 800 people had lost their jobs when that mine shut down. So what we've been able to do is hire um, the executive team that ran that mine, which was really good news for us, obviously, from a ex project execution standpoint, uh, but also good, you know, of course, for the continuity, the social economic stability to the, to, the, to the region, the city. And we hope to hire up to 450 of those laid off miners. And uh, so, again, this is... Uh, uh, really welcome news for the government. They're cheering us on, and and like Monica's uh, experience in, in Saskatchewan, the the area people around us, known as the Tuareg, they too are are, are cheering this on because, like any rural uh, settlement, uh, they're they're losing young people to the to the cities, and so here's an opportunity for us to train and and uh, and hire up those some of these young folks. Uh, which we're doing as we speak with mentoring and training programs underway at the moment. I guess that brings us around to, to jurisdiction as well. I mean, there's, uh, like all mining projects, uh, you know, you can have a great ore body, but if you're in the wrong part of the world, it doesn't, uh, doesn't help you too much. Um, you know, Niger has been a, a uranium producing country for a long period of time. How do you find 
uh, the, the government support there and uh, and what are they doing to to help you progress the project? Uh, well, there, there's no doubt that the, the jurisdiction ha has its challenges. Um, the, the government is is our partner in this project. They own 20% of the project, um, we're, we're the other 80%. And we sit collectively with a board of, board of directors, et cetera, and, and, and work together on, on any and all issues and challenges. Um, there, there, there aren't any, um, there, there, there are no impacts on us where we are. We're right in the middle of the country. There, there, are, there have been raids over the border at, at the east end and the west end, typically uh, raiding um, area villages proximal to the border and then running back over to say Mali or, or Burkina Faso or, or Nigeria. The, the government has uh, stepped up its uh, coordination with, with both the French military and the American military both of whom have large bases in country, um, in in order to stand these uh, stand these people down and uh, to to help the government establish or maintain security on the border regions. Inside, it's solid. Uh, it's the only democracy uh, in the neighborhood, and um, and we we found it to be a great place to be. We've been there since two thousand and seven. Uh, over which time we've we've got to know you know different different governments over, over the years and uh, nationally, regionally, and locally. Um, so it's uh, for us, it's been good. And for Arano, it's been good for 50 years. And, and Monica, obviously, Athabasca Basin, a, a prolific uranium um, region of Canada, uh, been production there for a number of years. You know, you guys are on the west side of the basin. There's a little bit less infrastructure there. How, how do you find um, discussions with, with the local politicians, bureaucrats? I mean, how, how are they progressing and helping you progress with respects to everything else that needs to come around that mine as you start to, to make a decision uh, to go into production? Well, there is a mine in the area. Um, so a highway runs through us, actually. So there's a mine called Clough Lake. So we do have decent infrastructure um, around us. Uh, the, the province have, has been very supportive. Saskatchewan is rated number two globally uh, on the mining scale. Uh, they're very pro-business. Uh, they love what we're doing. They even came out with the Saskatchewan First Act, uh, meaning that they want to bring minerals and they want to be uh, a crit critical mineral hub and clean energy hub for the world. Um, we've seen support as, as well from the federal government. So with the Critical Minerals Act and their support for uranium, um, SMRs and nuclear power in general. Um, yeah, it's, it's very good support from the federal and, and provincial side. All right, let's talk money. So obviously building a mine is not cheap and it takes money. Uh, Tim, you guys are in discussion with some uh, debt finance providers at the moment. Um, it's it's probably the first time in a decade that, that there's been serious discussions around project debt financing, a uranium project. How, how are you finding that journey? Um, how... Uh, has there been an education process to to bring to bring those debt providers uh, up to speed with the uranium story, um, and and do you think that there's others watching closely to see how successful you are uh, as they look also to have similar discussions? Well, starting with the second point first, uh, I think I think many are, eyes are on us and and how this is playing out. Uh, to the first point, with uh, with the development banks, uh, we're dealing with two. Uh, one of them is the Economic Development Bank of Canada. Another one's a U.S. group that prefer prefer to be named. Excuse me. After we go firm with everything, which we anticipate doing uh, in the current quarter, um, it was interesting. The um, the development banks that is they 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 looked at the uranium, and uh, yeah. They hadn't done a uranium project before, um, but they they came around to the the thinking on it that this was indeed uh, a source of, of of low carbon base load power that was uh, totally in sync with uh, overall net net zero and, and green initiatives overall, and uh, they were also keenly focused on the outsized role of a a, a big mining project uh, such as ours. Um, that, that will help will, will play in a development country uh, so again on the national regional and local levels and and they were quite keen to be part of that uh, and and were um, 
yeah, well, it was refreshing. We, we, we were surprised by, by, by the uptake there. I will say that the journey has been lengthy. Um, we've been dealing with the same two groups for about a year and a half or thereabouts. Uh, through that process, they do a, a very exhaustive uh, audit of, of, on the one hand, the plant, the project, the, the, the mineral deposit itself. But then on the other hand, the ESG components. So everything, uh, everything from our CSR initiatives in country, which we've done sort of things that you might 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 assume that we would have done, drought relief, food, uh, medical uh, training, education, uh, things of that nature, infrastructure like water wells, uh, but also the management policies, the HR policies, and, and and everything with a with a view towards Equator Principle Four and international finance performance standard compliance. And uh, really, really the compliance with those standards is a prerequisite um, for, 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 for going, going ahead with the development banks. They, they simply won't fund you unless you uh, are well along the way towards compliance with those standards. Uh, and, and then they back it up with an agreement Whereby you know they put you on a grid, they'll essentially mark you on where you are, and and come up with an ideas about what you have to do to get where they want you to be in terms of compliance and over what period of time, and 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 put that into a, a legal agreement. So um, performance against that is uh, is a, is a requirement to uh, draw funds under the loan. So very comprehensive, but at the at the same time had the uh, effect of auditing our, our project, uh, you know, inside and out, top to bottom, which is good for everybody, I think, and uh, should bring a lot of comfort to uh, to anybody looking at us as a potential investor and impacts that we're going to have on the ground and contributions to the country going forward. And and Monica, I mean, I guess you know you guys are. Uh, it, having discussions, it's a much bigger check to write, but it's it's an incredible scenario with your project where the money is almost being paid back before the ink's dried on the yeah. on the contracts. How how is that conversation going with potential debt providers? Where where that the payoff is so fast for them that you know are they wanting to stretch it out to have skin in the game for longer? I mean, it, it's it's it's, it's really interesting predicament that, that you're in because it, it it will when it starts producing just the debt's not there for more than a year or two right yeah though so they'll stretch it out for uh five i mean for, for seven to ten years uh so our capex is about 1.5 billion with working capital uh, but our payback period is 11 months and that's at current spot prices so when a debt provider looks like that, look, looks at that, they are pretty comfortable with providing debt. Uh, we could be 100% funded by debt. We're choosing to go with 65 to 70%. Uh, we're having ongoing conversations and we'll have a better idea by the end of this year what this looks like. But we're speaking to similar groups, um, EDC Canada, for instance, uh, being involved in a tier one project in Canada is, uh, a, in terms of a global image for Canada, it's, it's huge. So we're speaking to groups like that, as well as free money groups. So the, the, the strategic innovation fund, as well as um, groups like C um, the pension plan providers, global banks, uh, national banks. Um, yeah, so the conversation is fluid, it's ongoing, and it's, it's looking like it's gonna be quite uh, easy to finance. So 11 months payback at 50 odd dollars, fast forward 2027, if we're still at 50 odd dollars, we got a problem. You know. Agree. <laughs> Wow. And are you getting the sense, either of you, that, that, that there's a finite appetite for debt financing for uranium projects? I mean, my previous life, uh, I worked at banks and, and we would have commodity limits on, on project and debt finance where uh, we'd say, you know what, we've, there might be 10 great gold projects, but we've only got appetite for six or seven of them and we need to then go and find something else to just diversify commodity. Do you think being first mover and being such a, a, a bellwether opportunity that gives you the advantage that maybe the others are going to struggle to find that appetite? Or do you think the fact that you guys are moving in this field and, and this education and upskill makes, may make it easier for the others as they come through? I think it'll be easier for the others. I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a supply deficit. And 
all the Western governments uh, globally were seeing an adaption of uranium and nuclear power. So if we want to decarbonize and if we want to have energy security and affordability, we need nuclear to be part of the conversation and we're seeing it legislated uh, across the globe. So in the US, for instance, with the IRA, in Canada with the Critical Minerals Act, in Europe with the Industry Act, it, it's everywhere. So to finance these projects and there's not many of them at the same time. So since the last cycle, there's only been three new uranium discoveries. That's ourselves, ISO, and fission uranium. That's it. And everybody else is the same. It's all brownfield or existing. Uh, so, so yeah, I think they're going to be easy to finance these uranium projects if we want to decarbonize. I think in the last cycle, there was a, a, an analyst who's still around who was writing back in, uh, in 20, 2009 and 10 that there'd be 27 projects coming to market. I think seven of them made it. <laughs> but anyway, um, I, I guess you can't talk about financing without sort of uh, bringing up the C word and talking about contracting. You both have different approaches to that. Um, Tim, maybe you start there on 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 what uh, requirements potentially are around contracting some of your production so that there is cash flow uh, visibility on paying back the debt uh, and, and, and what's happening in those. And then maybe, Monica, we can then talk about uh the next gen approach to to utilities and contracting sure we've got uh, contracts with two utilities two north america utilities roughly four and a half million tons or pounds excuse me uh and that's two-thirds of what the bank would like to see us have before we go forward with the loan and draw it draws onto the loan rather uh, so we're, we're well along the way there and the financing it's interesting um uh, the pricing rather a half and half uh, base price and then and then a market component which would have a, a floor and a ceiling and so all, all pretty standard I think. Um, what surprised us was that uh, we were able to write these these contracts uh, you know quite last year so that would be a couple of years before we're going to be in production so I think it speaks to uh, the, su the supply uh, the supply dynamics in, in, the, in, in the market as a whole, but also to the the interest now occasioned by really Russia and Ukraine, of course, of uh, diversification of supply, and um, that that really what, what what that's amounted to for us is that we're actually getting calls from utilities, um, which is you know really sort of the, the shoes a little bit on the other foot there, and uh, pleasantly surprised by that. Um, even with offers of of, uh, of prepayments under the contract, so uh, I think it's a I think it's a strong market. And I, I think to Monica's point, there's there's wide scale government support for uranium and acceptance, increasingly so society wide of the key role that uranium is going to play in low carbon based load power. Monica, so we'll be contracting uh, on volume. And that we're going to be basing it on the spot price at time of delivery, which is different than majority of uh, the players out there. And part of the reason for that, uh, we don't think $50 is the right price. Uh, we, the pendulum is swinging in favor of the miners. There is an undersupply in the market. We think it's going to be going much higher, and we do want leverage to the upside of uranium. Um, also, just because of the way our deposit is hosted, uh, being in basement hosted rock, we can be flexible on our supply. So that really dictates our contracting strategy. Um, I mean, you can build a cathedral down there and it won't collapse. So that's another benefit to um, the deposit itself. But uh, we saw the same sort of thing play out in the lithium market, for instance. So a, a few years ago, uh, you needed a caller, you needed a fixed price. And now all the lithium suppliers have uh, the, the balls in, in their court, really. And we saw the price move from 50 to 500, 5,000 plus. So we're seeing the same, we, we think the same sort of thing is going to happen in the uranium market. We don't think that $50 is the right price. We think it's going to be going north of, a, north of 100. Oh, so I guess, uh, what have we got? Four minutes left. Let's see. The, 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 the question is, so when we're sitting here this time next year, where will the price be? Uh, and 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 where will your stock prices be? <laughs> well, I mean, contracted prices that we saw with like the U.S. Strategic Reserve were uh, from fifty-nine to seventy. So, it, it, I, I think it's going to be north of seventy-five. Personally, that's the incentive price in the U.S. around that seventy-five dollar mark. 
and where we're going to be, hopefully multiples of um, where we are currently. You know, that sounds like just a great answer. And uh, <laughs> I think I'd say pretty much the same thing. 75 is our internal near-term target and uh, pricing's up to the market. And at $75, both of your companies are spitting out some pretty significant free cash flow there. Um, I think are we uh, fairly close. All right, so I'd just like to say thank you to uh, Monica. Uh, NextGen is a publicly listed company on the Canadian, US, and Australian exchanges. So you can find them there. Global Atomic is, uh, is listed on the Canadian exchange. Uh, they're both part of the Tribeca Nuclear Opportunities portfolio as well. Uh, so I'd like to, unless there's any final closing comments that are, we're just needing to to get out into the uh, into the into the the audience here. Any final things to say? Thanks very much for having us. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. And um, I guess we're just entering the new nuclear renaissance, and this is just the beginning. Well, I look forward to being back here this time next year with not a spare seat in this crowd as everybody's clamoring to uh, to catch up with the thesis. So thank you, everybody, for your time. I really appreciate that. And thank you, too, for joining us up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guy. Thanks, Monica, and thanks, Tim. If we can just jump you in the middle for a picture. And we've got Marcus and my crew running onto stage. They're going to grab the chairs, et cetera, when that's done. I loved your last question. Anything last to stay in true Canadian style? It was something polite. Thank you very much. Thank you, guys. Thanks so much. Put your hands together again for Guy and our guiding our fireside chat for us. So we've got half an hour worth of more educational information for you here in Auditorium 1. I've just popped over to Auditorium 2 and there's been some great presentations in there this morning as well. They've got two more to go. So they're going to marry up with us and we'll be all be going out to lunch at the same time today. So I have got leading the charge here. We've got from Tribeca, the wonderful John. Tribeca, did I put, give you the wrong organisation? No, you are. Come back here so I can read you closer to me. So John Stover's coming up. So John is a portfolio manager for Tribeca Investment Partners. And if you were here first thing in the room yesterday morning, you would have heard his inspirational speak. He kicked us all off for the conference uh, yesterday morning. Uh, joining him on stage from Blackstone Minerals, we have Scott Williamson. <laughs> Uh, Pan Asia Metals, there is Paul Locke. From Mandika Copper and Gold, we've got Andrew Starkey. And Justin did make it in. Good on you. And we've got Justin Werner here as well from Nickel Industries. So this is our panel, our esteemed leader. And we've got half an hour. So again, Tim, I'll give you a, a wrap up at about five minutes to go. And we're going to have a lunch break today. Our lunch break will run through to, I think it's 1.25. So between quarter to one and 1.25, we'll have a nice decent lunch break and that'll give us time to get in and get invested in the afternoon. We've got one more panel session and we also have, of course, our conference closing cocktail parties today, thanks to the Lind partners. And we look forward to your staying around with us and having a chat about what you've seen. And it was really interesting when I came in this morning to see a couple of you in here bright and early, you'd beaten the traffic in. And uh, you were there with your computer. So what are you doing? Are you a journalist? Are you reporting on what's happening here today? Because we've got a lot of international journalists at the conference. And they said, no, we've actually taken notes and we're just writing up our notes from yesterday. And we're getting ourselves ordered today so we can hear all the information and hear all the opportunities. So here is another one for us. John, over to you. And thank you so much for agreeing to chair this panel for us. Thanks a lot, Chrissy. And thanks everyone for joining. Uh, really excited to be a part of this panel. We, we have four distinguished speakers from Southeast Asia here that uh, are representing a few different countries. So we have Justin Werner, who's Managing Director of Nickel Industries, um, and Andrew Starkey, who is Executive Chairman of Merdeka Battery Materials. They are representing Indonesia. We have Paul Locke, who's Chairman and Managing Director of Pan-Asia Metals, and Scott Williamson, who is Managing Director of Blackstone Minerals. So. I think Southeast Asia actually has one of the most interesting and exciting stories in the energy transition globally. Uh, we've obviously seen, you know, historically it's been thought of as uh, a commodity producer and a natural resource exporter, but increasingly we're seeing a lot of really exciting and interesting downstream stories in the region. Uh, Indonesia obviously uh, has uh, invested multi billions of dollars into its nickel and cobalt processing value chains increasingly looking at going into batteries and even uh, EV auto manufacturing. 
and we also see in Thailand and, and Vietnam, for instance, the there's already a robust audio manufacturing industry and, and a couple of the companies here are, are looking to feed into that value chain. So what I'd like to start off with, and I'll and we'll just go down the row here um, after uh, you know quick intros from from each of the panelists on their on their uh, companies. But I'd like to ask the first question um, after you give that introduction, which is we've obviously seen a lot of discussion around Inflation Reduction Act and you know the impact that it's going to have on this industry, the advantages that it's going to give Euro U.S. and free trade agreement producers of battery and minerals. Uh, potential bifurcated pricing. So, you know, that obviously could put Southeast Asia producers at a disadvantage. But what I'd like to ask is, what are the advantages of being a Southeast Asia based producer of battery minerals um, that could potentially mitigate those impacts? So, why don't, Scott, why don't we start with you? Yeah, thanks. Uh, so, yeah, we, we're very lucky to be operating in Northern Vietnam. It's the uh, previously, uh, previous operating Banfork nickel mine. One of the real benefits we have is we have abundant renewable hydroelectric power, and that puts us in a really strong position compared to our peers, and particularly from the electric vehicle industry. So there's a real focus on net zero carbon or low carbon nickel, and we have the ability to achieve that from day one. So yeah, the, that's probably the key benefit of, of operating in northern Vietnam, and also the the competitive labour costs as well. So and and the skilled labor so some of the best um skilled labor we've seen in any emerging market in uh, northern vietnam there we go thanks john uh paul lock from pan asia metals um our big focus is costs so in southeast asia the reason a lot of manufacturing comes to southeast asia is because it's a low cost envi uh, environment it's got a highly skilled workforce where we are in Thailand, the largest uh, auto producer in Southeast Asia and the fourth largest in Asia, we've got an emerging EV and LIB ecosystem. And uh, as John mentioned at the start, there's a, a lot of opportunity to feed into that. So that's the opportunity we see. Hi, John. Thanks for having us here. Andrew Starkey from Medeca Group. Uh, Medeca Battery Materials, this is our um, Indonesian listed nickel themed uh, EV battery materials company. The company's listing on the IDX on the 18th of April. We've just closed the books. So a new, a new chapter for us uh, as we take this company to market. In terms of asset base, um, our large asset is the, uh, is the SCM nickel mine. Uh, it has approximately 14 million tonnes of contained nickel in the resource. So our big challenge is how do we monetize such an enormous uh, resource base uh, in the near term? So. Uh, very much focused on the downstream processing opportunities and the value adding opportunities uh, as our nickel goes through in the EV battery material chain. At the moment, we have RKF plants uh, producing both nickel pig iron and a nickel mat conversion option there. And we also have uh, announced a recent joint venture with CATL from China regarding an HPAL plant to produce MHP, one of the uh, key intermediate materials in the EV batteries chain. Uh, just addressing directly then that question regarding um, why we think Southeast Asia, Indonesia, in our case in particular, is a sensible place to be based for this activity. Um, Indonesia's uh, participation in the nickel um, global production share is, is continuing to grow. It's uh, more than 60% at the moment. That's scheduled to increase. So simply by uh, proximity to nickel. Uh, Indonesia will be playing a role uh, for decades to come in the processing of, of that material. And then when it comes to costs, uh, sh sharing with the other speakers here, we, we see that our capex and opex costs are a fraction of, of conducting similar activities in other jurisdictions. Uh, so that, that locks in uh, margins for us uh, on very fundamental reasons that we think will, will last the duration of our assets as well. So thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, Justin Werner, Nickel Industries. Um, they look to 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 go to the advantages of of being in in Indonesia. Um, I think, as as Andrew's highlighted, um, it's simply the significant resources that that exist, and still many areas are are, are underexplored. Um, you compare that to sulphide deposits, which you know, if you look globally, consistently larger and larger. Um, exploration results or, or or new discoveries are um, are getting harder and harder. Whereas laterite, there is an abundance, it's right on the surface. Um, and, and so to Andrew's point, it's then we've got this abundance of, of nickel. 
how do we process it in a, in a, in a cost-effective and environmentally friendly way. That's another advantage that, that we have in Indonesia. Um, there is significant renewable power opportunity. Um, Valet has operated with a very large hydropower facility since, since the 70s. Um, we have a 420 megawatt peak solar project, uh, which we're in the stages of implementing, and we've successfully implemented one at our mine, which reduced our uh, diesel consumption by about 31 million tonnes a year. Um, another advantage that we have in Indonesia is obviously very supportive policies from the Indonesian government. So our operations have tax holidays that range anywhere from seven years to 15 years of zero tax. And so as a result, very strong cash flows. We sit right at the very bottom end of the cost curve. And the final advantage is that some of these industrial parks that have been built within Indonesia, um, the significant infrastructure that exists there now in terms of port power, trained workforce that allows a lot of these projects to be rolled out with a with a capex guarantee and obviously a tremendous value in that given particularly if you look across the battery metal uh, chain there has been significant cap out capex blow it, blowouts that have been uh, recently announced by by a number of uh, players in that in that space I think um, just out of interest, um, both Nickel Industries and Medeca's assets are, are in a similar region. And uh, the timeframes that we can get these new downstream processing plants constructed in these uh, pre-permitted industrial parks is, is really astounding. Um, two, two, three years from a vacant site to a high margin project. So uh, that's one of the advantages. These, these uh, mineral processing industrial parks, of which there's around half a dozen sizable ones in Indonesia um, have really become a, a portal for, for getting your projects up and running quickly. And uh, you can remove permitting, licensing, et cetera, from the critical timeline. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it's a prepackaged arrangement to a large extent. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. And I, I agree, it's been, um, it's just been incredible to watch. I was on site there in August and the scale of, of things and the quickness and how, how quickly they go up, um, certainly a lot of advantages to being in one industrial park. Um, I'd like to ask maybe Scott here. So we've obviously heard a lot this week about auto, auto manufacturers looking to go upstream, battery manufacturers looking to do upstream deals. Um, what do you think, and I know you've had some discussions with downstream players as well, what, what are they looking for when they look, look for an upstream partner? Yeah, so it, it's interesting. We've been on this journey uh, for three or four years looking for a downstream partner. Um, we've focused our efforts on South Korea. When we started that process three or four years ago, it was it was all about nickel and any nickel, and now it's the the conversation has moved to low carbon nickel, and that's we believe that's being driven by the European car manufacturers. So that's being pushed into the battery industry. There's a real focus on a clean nickel product. Um, the, I think jurisdiction is important so the South Koreans are, are very happy to invest in in Southeast Asia and and I think they understand Southeast Asia as good as anyone so they they are very happy to to invest in Vietnam and, and obviously Indonesia as well so it's yeah it it's a real focus on on a clean green product and, and ESG compliance whereas three or four years ago that wasn't in the conversation it was it was just about any nickel now it's yeah it's definitely the conversation has has changed considerably got it thanks for that um and i might uh come come back to the the guys with indonesian assets so obviously both of you are looking at hpals that's been um you know something I, I i know is it's a more it's a newer technology there's been some questions around viability etc also obviously much lower carbon emission intensity so can you guys just talk through your decision-making process process there when you looked at the HPAL and and why you've decided to to move ahead with it. Um, Justin, maybe we can start with you. You know, look, we, um, we, we've we moved ahead with a 10% acquisition of the Huayu Nickel Cobalt project, which was the first project to successfully commission in, in the IMIP. Uh, has the world record for the fastest build, it was built in a little over 18 months during the, the, the COVID pandemic, um, lowest OPEX, and lowest carbon intensity. So the current carbon intensity is around six to seven tonne of carbon per tonne of nickel. Um, you compare that to pyrometallurgical processes, which sit around sort of 60 tonne. Um, you can see it's it's uh, the carbon intensity is, is very attractive, but not only that, um, Huayu has a clear plan to be net zero by, by 2030. Um, 
why is the carbon footprint so low? It has the world's largest sulfuric acid plant, which generates a significant amount of heat in the production of the sulfuric acid. And so in that, that allows for the uh, generation of power. HPAL also um, is being heavily supported by the government. There's been you know, tremendous growth in uh, nickel pig iron capacity in Indonesia. Um, but uh, one of the side effects of that has been that in order to get access to the high grade ore, a lot of the lower grade limonite ore that, that sits at the surface um, has been discarded. And as a result, we've seen a reasonable amount of that has been sterilized. So the Indonesian government in its wisdom recognized that you know, this wasn't sustainable. There was a very valuable uh, resource sitting at top um, that delivers not just nickel, but also cobalt. Chrome can also be extracted um, and, and other elements. And so you know, we see it as very attractive. You only have to look at, obviously, Ford has just recently concluded their agreement with, uh, with, with Vale and Huayu in Indonesia. Um, and look, I expect to see um, more global North American, European um, OEMs looking to Indonesia to shore up security of supply because it, it, it really is sort of the, as, as Andrew outlined, you know, more than 50% of global nickel comes out of Indonesia currently and, and that will continue to grow. I think all the, all the good points were taken. Maybe some anecdotes. For, so we re recently ran um, an informal process uh, on, on who would partner with us on our HPAL plants. And it became apparent from that exercise that the interest in investing in Indonesian HPAL plants, uh, North Asian, European, North American, uh, it, it's extensive. Uh, their interest is in securing a stake in, in the MHP, in that material, uh, precisely uh, the basis for Ford's uh, recent investment decision. Um, so for the OEMs and, and the industry participants, it's, it's clear it's access to physical offtake. For a uh, company like ourselves and nickel industries with these large resources that we're looking to monetize, of course, HPAL is the, is the highest margin route to do that. And the economics on these plants are, are really quite astounding. Um, the, the future margin of, of the MHP product, that's, um, that's for people to take their view on the demand and supply of that product. But the, uh, the payback period on these, uh, on these multi-billion dollar assets is, is very rapid. So the decision to invest um, is, is really around certainty of the resource to feed into that plant. Uh, once you tick that box, um, then, then uh, you're looking for partners that have had success with the technology. And I think we are now clearly in the fourth generation of the HPAL technology. Um, we have this question a lot during our IPO, just how, um, how confident are we that these plants can operate? The, the plant that uh, Nickel Industries is, is taking a stake in is one of the great benchmarks now in Indonesia to show, I think, well above nameplate capacity production, um, costs are shaping up. So I think it's that maturity of the technology now that um, has crossed over that threshold point. Yeah, great. Thanks for that. Um, and maybe we touch on Thailand. I, you know, it's obviously not traditionally seen as a lithium producing country, but I'm curious how you see the industry there or, or in your projects. How do they stack up um, to some of the projects we've heard about in, in say, Australia or South America? Well, John, our, our projects are smaller, if, um, but it's not really about project size or project grade. And this is where I think a lot of investors go wrong. It's very easy to look at tons and grade. But the reality is it's where you sit on the cost curve. So we were talking about, or you mentioned um, OEMs and what they're looking for in a project. Uh, in our discussions, they're actually looking for uh, position or potential position on the cost curve because it's no use going down the path with a high cost player. And then when the commodity cycle turns and all commodity cycles go through the cycle, uh, they find that their, their partner uh, can't actually deliver. So um, uh, on the question of, OEMs and what they're looking for, uh, or in our case, chemical manufacturers, um, they're actually looking for a certainty of supply, and that includes certainty of supply in the, in the price cycle. The Thai chemi uh, chemical market is extremely deep. It's one of the largest chemical markets in Southeast Asia, and there's a lot of opportunity to produce um, specialty chemicals for batteries. Great, thank you. And in, 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 I guess from your perspective as well, in terms of, we've heard a lot upstream versus downstream. And I think most of you have a you know, variety of ambitions. Everyone has an upstream resource. Everyone has some ambitions to go downstream. Um, you know, how do you think through that in terms of, maybe Scott, how do you think through that in terms of where, where the value sits, where the margin sits, 
Is it unique to each different product? Um, does it depend on your partners? Um, how do you go through that with your board? Yeah, so our, our decision was pretty easy because there's a, a tariff on nickel concentrate in Vietnam, so we weren't keen to pay that. So we went downstream from day one, and what we found is that the the chemical industry needs chemical products. So nickel concentrate isn't really a product that can be fed into the lithium ion battery chemical um, cathode industry. So very quickly we realized we needed to convert that concentrate into a chemical product. Um, so we're looking at a MHP intermediate and then going to nickel sulfate. We then combine the nickel sulfate with cobalt and manganese sulfate to produce the NCM811 product. So there's a lot of value add there, um, but to do that, we do need partnerships with downstream players. So it's important if you want to move into the downstream, you have to build those strong relationships. And, and that's why we've spent a fair a lot of time in South Korea, understanding exactly what products and, and what specs are required for those downstream chemical products. And yeah, it's definitely worth uh, the effort and, and, it, and there's, a, there's a real value add there. Um, but yeah, it does take a lot of time and um, yeah, the partnerships, yeah, uh, are ongoing and, and, and we continue to work on them, but it's, um, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely a work in progress for us. I was going to ask Justin, actually, in terms of, um, you know, I was, I was quite surprised and uh, pleasantly surprised that, that you guys were able to get the nickel mat uh, conversion up and running that quickly and it seems to be going well with the margins, but what it, could you talk through that in terms of um, you know being able to toggle between the stainless steel demand and and the battery value chain, and how big can nickel mat get for you guys? Yes, yeah, so it, the nickel mat is an interesting one. Ching San's been the first company to successfully take rotary kiln electric furnaces that historically could only produce NPI, which is a class two product, and and can only be sold into the stainless steel market. With a with a minor modification, but the IP sort of sits in the all specs and and the the temperature and conditions they run the furnace at. They were able to produce a, a low grade nickel mat, um, which could then be put through a converter to produce a a, a saleable high grade uh, nickel mat. Um, and the margins obviously currently are, are, are much stronger. Our our NPI margins from exact from similar kilns producing NPI last quarter, we're about 2,250. Our margins from uh, nickel mat were almost $6,000 a tonne. So there is a big margin differential currently. Um, so the ability to swing production between NPI and between um, nickel mat, that we see is very valuable. It does have a higher carbon footprint. And so it's not gonna be applicable to, to everyone. And that's really why then the, Diversif further diversification into the HPAL um, in the new plant that, that we're looking at building, that will go further than just MHP. It will go all the way to nickel sulfate and as well nickel cathode. Um, so really a sort of a diversified suite of products, which you know, will give us exposure to all the, all, all, all the key elements of the, of the nickel market and, and their different sort of supply demand fundamentals and pricing that we think will play out over the sort of coming years. Yeah, great. And Paul, I think you had something to say on the upstream versus downstream. I was, I was about to say the key word is exposure. So uh, we uh, made the decision to go downstream really early in the piece. And one of the key reasons is that uh, lithium's hot uh, and in short supply. Um, so you've got a, a different dynamic when it comes to working with knowledge partners. So we call the partners knowledge partners. We're bringing the product, they're bringing the IP and um, we're looking to do 50-50 sort of joint ventures. But the reason we want to move downstream too is that um, the further you move from the concentrate, the less volatility there is in your margins and the more customers you get, and then it gets to exposure. So your, your face or, or customer face starts to expand. And as your company grows, there'll be new opportunities for M&A or development or other partnerships. So that's really our key driver. Got it, thank you. Uh, and in terms of, I mean, I want to touch on capital markets as well, because, you know, we obviously have three Australian listed uh, producers that are actually have assets in Southeast Asia here. Andrew just went, has gone through a, an IPO um, in Indonesia. And maybe, Andrew, you can touch on your experience there, because I'm curious, you know, we heard from the SGX this morning, 
it seems like a, a region that's ripe for more uh, listed companies in this space. What, what was your feedback from investors? Yeah, I mean, it, it's uh, it was one of the early considerations whether we continued with uh, with an IDX listing. Of course, Medeca Copper Gold, the the uh, uh, foundation mining business, is IDX listed. That that's gone well for us in terms of market research, uh, follow on capital raisings, uh, general positioning the company. Uh, we have a number of IDX businesses in the portfolio, so that was the, the obvious choice for us. Um, there, there is a there is a sector there. There is a, a grouping of analysts, investors, uh, particularly in, in Indonesia, that are just aware of the significance of the sector to Indonesia. So, of course, uh, the, the dozen or so listed coal companies probably set the scene. Uh, now we have gold, copper, and and nickel listings. Uh, one of the interesting um, aspects that came out of the the investor discussions recently is probably this idea that. If you're sitting in London or New York and you want exposure to uh, copper or gold, you don't have to go as far as the IDX. Uh, but now if, if you do want um, exposure to uh, nickel and some of this downstream processing, then you, you can go to the ASX and, and you should probably also have a look at the IDX now as well. So we've seen a number of investors take interest who previously had, had never considered in their portfolio uh, IDX investments. So um, I think that's an interesting feature uh, of, of the way the nickel sector is going, the listed nickel sector in Indonesia. Yeah, thanks. Uh, what about liquidity um, uh, and where are your core investors coming from in the IPO? Uh, so we list on the 18th, but our, our existing business, um, I think at different times, we've been in, in the top three, top 10, uh, most liquid, uh, liquid uh, stocks on the IDX. So any, anywhere from 20 to 40 million dollars us a day uh, of traded volume on the idx the investors that there's a strong support of, of domestic investors so there are i mean indonesia is a big country you've got lots of pension funds insurance companies uh, high net worth individuals um, and then we do we probably have about 10 to 15 percent of our register our international investors so particularly out of europe uh, the uk um, and, and then perhaps north asia and, and elsewhere uh, it has taken time to build up that that um, breadth of investor certainly at IPO uh, with our foundation company around uh, six seven years ago it was very Indonesian focused so it's been a concerted effort to broaden that. Great and in terms of uh, I guess government support and and so what are governments feeling about this sector in the region Justin maybe you can touch on from your perspective obviously yeah the, the Indonesia nickel ore export ban kind of kicked off this whole downstream move in the first place. There's always things in the press about potential different changes to the law, et cetera. I mean, what's uh, your feeling from that side? Yeah, I think the Indonesian policy is, has been extremely successful and it, it's a rare example of a government actually taking a long-term view. Um, I think when they first banned the export of raw ore, you know, everyone said, well, A, it won't happen or B, they'll pretty quickly reverse it because they'll realize all of the, you know, the, the, the revenue that they're losing. Um, fast forward only, only, only a few years, um, you know, barely 10 years since that policy was enacted. And you look at the actual and now sort of committed investments somewhere around 70 billion US. Um, and it, it, as I mentioned earlier, the, the names that you see that are now invested and breaking ground in Indonesia, you know, we've touched on Ford, Hyundai and Mitsubishi have broken ground on the first um, electric vehicle plants in Indonesia. BASF has broken ground on a, on a battery plant. Um, you know, the, the, the names Tesla has been on a number of visits and, and is having a, a very hard look. VW has, has MOUs. So, and I think what the government has provided is, you know, coming back to the sort of difference of listing between the ASX and, and the IDX, we unfortunately still get discounted for that perceived sovereign risk, you know, even though we have a very strong partner, um, both Chinese and, and local. Um, but you know, that's just a reality of, of you know the market that 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 we exist in. But look, I think the government has has made all the right decisions, um, particularly when you look now at sort of developing the limonite resorts and the HPAL. They said no to correctly to deep sea tailings as a possible option for, 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 for management of tailings. Um, so as a result, they've forced everyone to go to dry stack tailings, which is the best solution that, you know, for any, any tailing storage. So look, I think the government has, has, has done a great job. And not only that, the policy is actually carried through changes in government, which is also you know, very important because that's also one of the key risks that 
we get asked with, well, there's an election coming up next year. Um, what happens if we get someone who's you know not 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 so uh, friendly to all of this foreign investment? Hey, Scott, what about from your perspective? What what sort of interactions have you had with the government? Yeah, so we uh, we've also had very um, competitive tax incentives in the early years. So zero um, percent in the first four years, five percent in the next uh, over the next ten years. So we've got a government that is very much incentivizing foreign direct investment and and also very keen to build out the battery supply chain. Um, we've got a local electric vehicle company, Vinfast. Um, they've also built a battery plant recently. So, yeah, not quite to the same scale as Indonesia, but we've got a similar um, government, a, a very supportive government and, and a similar opportunity. So, uh, unfortunately, we don't have as much nickel as Indonesia, so um, we'll see how it plays out. But... Yeah, we've definitely got a very a supportive government in Vietnam. Beautiful. Well, look, I think that covers most of the main topics. I know we're running up against lunch here, so won't keep everyone from the food. But thanks to, very much to the panelists here today. Appreciate your thoughts. And uh, thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks very much, Jim. We'll just keep you up here for a photograph if we can. And as you're making your way out the room, the program for the afternoon includes, we've got four companies presenting in here, including you, Scott. So I think you're sandwiched in the middle there. So we've got four companies for you to hear from. We've got